Today we are having a discussion on a case of carcinoma larynx. Patient's name is Mr. Babu. He is 51 year old gentleman and is a driver by an occupation. His presenting complaints are hoarseness for the past four months and throat pain for the past three months. History of presenting complaints. Patient was apparently normal when he noticed hoarseness four months back. He also had throat pain for the past three months. He doesn't have any history of any fever with cough or difficulty in swallowing or dysphagia and no history of any respiratory symptoms. Personal history. He's an ex-smoker and an ex-alcoholic. He smoked cigarettes one packet per day for past 25 years and consumed alcohol almost every day, 30 ml per day for past 25 years. Past history. He is a diagnosed case of hepatitis B and has no other comorbidities. Moving on to clinical examination, he has a performance status of 1 and all vitals were within normal limits. Local examination, examination of oral cavity, he doesn't have any trismus or angeloglossia. He has a fair oral hygiene, nicotine stains were present in tooth and no visible or palpable lesion in oral cavity. Examination by indirect laryngoscopy. It revealed an ulcero proliferative lesion in the anterior one third of left vocal cord and congestion in posterior one third of left vocal cord. Bilateral vocal cords were mobile. Examination of neck, palpable nodes, and examination of nose, no mass was visualized. Examination of bilateral ear were normal. He was further evaluated with an NPL scopy, which showed an ulcero proliferative lesion involving left anterior one third of vocal cord and bilateral vocal cords were mobile. Here we can see a whitish growth in the left anterior one third of vocal cord. And in the second figure, we can see the posterior pharyngeal wall and the two arytenoids. And in the sides, we can see two pyriform fossa. And then uh, a biopsy was done, which showed moderately differentiated squamous cell carcinoma. He was further evaluated with CT neck, which showed an enhancing soft tissue proliferation involving left glottis with involvement of left false and root cords with extension to anterior commissioner and left paraglotic pad with subglotic extension. Hence, to summarize the case, Mr. Babu, 51 year old gentleman, presented with biopsy proven transglotic carcinoma, clinically T3N1 for further evaluation and treatment. And moving on to how to proceed further will be discussed by Dr. Cecil Thomas. Sir, please. Uh, I don't, can you, can you close your slides? Can okay, you sir, okay. Oh, okay, sir. So this is a 51 year old gentleman who is a, a smoker, alcoholic, who is a hepatitis B positive patient presented with a, a hoarseness of four months duration. Okay, so when you think about hoarseness, so, so we'll start with the history taking. So when you have a hoarseness, when you have hoarseness, never think that it is always a carcinoma larynx. Suppose if a patient is a smoker, alcoholic, and patient is having hoarseness, you have to think few things in mind. One, see a larynx. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, I think I'm audible. Okay. Yeah. Yes. yes. Okay. One, one is carcinoma larynx. Second is you have to think about see a lung. Then CA esophagus. These are the three important things you have to think. And if you if a patient is a female, not a smoker, not an alcohol, and the patient uh, female, then or a patient who is not a smoker and alcoholic, always you have to think about CA thyroid. Okay. So it's, especially if it's a female, uh, the first DD should be a carcinoma thyroid. So any hoarseness. Then other presentations, any tumors in the mediastinum, which can cause a left recurrent laryngeal palsy, can cause hoarseness. Lung, esophagus, patient with a, a CM breast, lymphoma, these all can host, cause hoarseness. So never think that everything uh, is attributed to CL larynx. That is first and foremost thing I want to emphasize. Patient who is a chronic smoker, respiratory symptoms, on general examination if a person is having clumping, and patient is having a left, small left supraclavicular frozen or right supraclavicular frozen. Uh, then in that situation, and you have to think the patient should have a CL lung as the first year diagnosis. Then you have to do, uh, the, you have to approach just like CL lung rather than doing a flex, uh, flexible endoscopy and trying for the biopsy. So you have to take the history proper. In this patient, patient is having a, a difficulty and foreign body throat pain also. We have to think more of a laryngeal pathology. If a patient is having 
dysphagia, uh, then later, later the patient develops hoarseness, you have to think the patient is having a hyperpharyngeal tumor. Then it is extending into larynx and patient is having hoarseness. Okay, this is the first important thing. And when you have a throat pain, patient is having a hoarseness. Then if a patient is having a laryngeal tumor, the moment you see the patient, most important thing is most important aspect you have to consider whether the, whether an acute any any we need to rule out any other emergency thing like strider. The patient is having any strider. Okay, so the moment you the patient comes in, you have to ensure that the patient is not tachypneic. Okay, then in the general examination uh, he has mentioned uh, the all general examination important things you have to look whether the patient is having a clubbing that is very important. Then always you should have a thyroid. You have to examine whether the patient is having a thyroid swelling. Then if it is, uh, you think that it's more of a laryngeal tumor, you have to think whether the laryngeal framework is enlarged, any displaying of thyroid cartilage, laryngeal crepitus is present or not, then is cervical lymph nodes are present. Then you have to rule, then you have to think, uh, then you have to consider a uh, IL examination. Most of the time you come across a biopsy proven custom of the larynx. Okay, so that is the situation you come across most of the time. Then in larynx, uh, you have to, what are the investigations you have to do in a suspected case of customer the larynx? One, you have to do a, in the, in the OP, you will do a flexible endoscopy, uh, sorry, general, uh, a, a indirect laryngoscopy. So you have to do, uh, or you can do a, a office endoscopy also. So this is the epiglottis, you have to, uh, you have to consider, this is a false cord, it's true occult cord. This is the uh, uh, arytenoid. This is the array epiglottic fold. So you have the pyriform sinus. This is how you look like in a uh, IL examination. Okay, so, uh, okay. so this, this is a true vocal code. So you have to do an IL examination and uh, then you go for the flexible endoscopy and you try for a biopsy. And most important thing, in certain situations, you should not try a biopsy. Suppose if you have a patient is having a mild stride, and uh, you think that if you try for a biopsy, then that will end up in a tracheostomy. In that situation, you have to search for a lymph node. In pure glottic tumors, you may not come across a lymph node. But in a supraglottic tumors, you can consider a, a, if you have patient is a mild strider, patient is not having a biopsy, you are seeing a tumor there by in the endoscopy, you avoid a biopsy, you try an FNAC from the node if possible. And if you think that, uh, this will lead on to an aggravation of the airway compromise. Then a biopsy should not be done. I'm not saying biopsy should not be done, but this is a, you have to negotiate whether that will end up in tracheostomy. In such situations, the FNAC may be desirable rather than going for a uh, biopsy. Okay, then you try to get in such situations, there is an airway compromise, then you admit the patient, you take an FNAC, you discuss with the pathologist, you try to get the, the renal function test done, you try to do uh, start the chemotherapy. This may be the situation where you consider an induction program. If a patient is having a cartilage intact and patient is having a bulky tumor, but there is an airway compromise, but there is no severe lead on to a severe strider, then in such situations, you consider a mild strider, you admit the patient and you consider an induction program. And okay, so that may be the situation where you will not consider biopsy. Then FNAC in... So when you do a flexible endoscopy, these are the important things you need from your head and neck surgeon. One, where is the tumor like? Where it is in the supraglottis, pyriform fossa, where the tumor is in the glottis? What is the nature of the growth? Extension in the other subsites because the larynx staging is not based on the size criteria. It is not based on two to four, less than two or more than four centimeter. It is based on size criteria. Suppose a patient is having a supraglottic tumor extending into glottis, and it becomes T2. A glottis extending in a supraglottis is T2. So glottis extending in a subglottis is T2. And a transglottic cosmome is also T2. If a patient is having a glottic tumor extending in the supraglottis and also in the subglottis, that is also a T2 disease. Never think that it is a T3 disease. Okay, I will come to that T3 disease, what the T3, T3 disease is. Then extension to subsides, the mobility of the ocular cord, because uh, if it is if fully mobile, then it becomes T1. This patient had a lesion in the ocal cord and fully mobile cord. Then, then okay, then mobility of the ocal cord. Second is, uh, other thing is anterior commissure is involved or not. If anterior commissure is involved. If the anterior commissure is involved, then the patient is likely to have a transglottic spread, number one. Number two, patient can have an extralandial spread in the anterior aspect. 
so these are all concerns when you have a when you have a um, and your commissioner is involved then extension to pyriform was or the patient is having extension into pyriform force hypopharynx suppose a patient is a marge says a supraglottic tumor and epiglottic fold tumor extending into pyriform fossa then it becomes a t2 disease and otherwise also a hypopharyngeal tumor extending into supraglottic is also t2 disease then airway valvation this is very important then what any signs of any aspiration frank aspiration is concerned. also and you need a biopsy so these are the important things you need from a flexible endoscopy and next is after a biopsy so that i don't already mention the patient underwent a, a flexible endoscopy and a biopsy showed as squamosal carcinoma next approach is what are the investigations you need to need to do for such patients so after endoscopy and biopsy and no emergency if the patient is not having any emergency next step is to consider the patient for a ct scan ct is the investigation of choice for laryngeal and hypopharyngeal tumors because ct scan is more specific and uh, uh, the mri is more sensitive and especially if you want to analyze the cartilage then ct is more specific rather than mr mr is more sensitive so you you may get come across a lot of false positive the so true uh, then the specificity is better with a ct scan you have to do an x ray chest in certain situations you have to do a ct thorax you have to be very clear when which all situations you have to consider a ct thorax if any tumor in the larynx with extension into the uh, subglottic extension or just extending into trachea lower cervical nodes a post cricoid involvement from a supraglottic tumor then in the situations you have to rule out a upper mediastinal nodes lower cervical nodes suppose a patient is having a level 4 node and you have to rule out upper mediastinal nodes or a parenchymal lung parenchyma then if a patient is having say clubbing is present uh in that situation you have to rule out a ct thorax you have to do a ct thorax and you rule out a synchronous primary in the lung then that is the situation where you have to do a ct thorax otherwise uh, if you do not have a nodes the patient is not having any extension to subglottis or a post cricoid involvement then you need not do a ct scan of the thorax or pd baseline investigations include cbc rft the lft is required for this patient because the patient is having hepatitis b is positive then uh, then uh, blood sugar evaluation you have to do a dental prophylaxis then there is no need to do a pet scan or any other distant in metastatic invasive like bone scan ultrasonography abdomen and uh, only for oropharyngeal carcinomas you need to do a p16 assay in laryngeal hypopharyngeal and oropharyngeal uh, sorry oral cavity tumors there is no need to do a uh, p16 assay as a routine and there is not right it is not recommended so uh, you have to do uh, clinically you have to uh, properly examine the patient uh, you have to analyze he said it is a 51 year old gentleman performance status is 1 and patients who have elderly patients who have poor performance status like performance status 3 or more there is no point in evaluating the patient so in such situations avoid investigations like ct neck because you are not going to plan a radical approach okay in this patient should be considered for a palliative approach okay so a very elderly patients patients who have poor performance as who are candidate for palliative treatment are not considered for extensive investigations including a ct scan of the neck you can argue for that okay sir if you do a ct thorax ct neck then you can uh, you can understand so many things but you may be considering a palliative treatment then uh, so this is uh, the investigations uh, so first and foremost thing is you have to uh, consider Uh, a ct scan you try to read the ct scan by yourself then you stage the disease then you assess the function of the larynx uh, by a fluoroscopy then you consider that patient for uh, organ preservation if it is no aspiration no cartilage is intact or then you consider laryngectomy if a patient is having loose aspiration or patient is having a cartilage disease that is advanced disease in early disease your intention is to consider whether it is confined to occlusal cord because this endoscopy did not show any uh, signs of any uh, subglottic extension although he said a t3n1 larynx it was based on a ct scan finding rather than a clinical examination so from the clinical examination uh, you can only say it is you are dealing with a t1 occlusal cord so uh, this is fully mobile cord confined to one cord and uh, 
there is no subclotting extension no supraglottic extension uh, sorry uh, so you can uh, there was a super uh, i don't there was a supraglottic extension in the uh, flexible endoscopy or only it was only confined to one vocal cord right i don't ah uh, sir it was confined to left vocal cord only okay thank you so it is a t1 disease so then you have to do a ct scan uh, to know any early paraglottic fat infiltration is present any submucosal extension into the supraglottis or subglottis that is really you are dealing with a t1 disease because if you are dealing with a t1 disease if it's t1 opal cord you need only uh, either you can consider that patient for a radiotherapy or a laser laser treatment but this patient is not a candidate for laser treatment because it is i mean anterior very close to the anterior commission so this patient will be a candidate for radiotherapy So you stage, uh, you do a CT scan. Then the CT scan, uh, you have to consider certain things. Where is the primary tumor? That is number one. There is the primary site. Second is uh, where the where all the this local spread. Patient is having extension in the supraglottis, subglottis, piriform fossa. The patient is having any mobility of the vocal cord, any uh, any dysfunction, airway compromise. superior extent that is a superior extent the patient is having supraglottis vase is extending in the valvular base of form and whether any subglottic extension is present a post cricoid these are all concerns this all you need from a ct scan so there is a checklist for uh, for evaluation of uh, ct scan of the larynx that i will discuss at the end so you try to uh, uh, understand the radiology properly so they i will discuss the ct scan of this patient so this is the hyoid bone and you have the this is the epiglottis uh, uh, can you make out where my mouse is moving yes okay. yes sir yes sir okay thank you so this is the epiglottis and this is the area epiglottic this is the piriform fossa this is the posterior pharyngeal okay and this is the pre epiglottic space this is the paraglottic fat okay and the pre epiglottic space and the paraglottic fat will look hypodense in general it is due to fat okay so if you are seeing any enhancement you have to think that you are dealing with some pathology there so this is a uh, the piriform fossa and this is a uh, this is the lower cut so lower down you can see that this is the thyroid cartilage started up here the thyroid cartilage started up here and this patient this is the piriform fossa right piriform fossa this is the this is the pre epiglottic space coming down paraglottic fat and this is a false cord and this is a ventricle posterior pharyngeal wall this is the left uh, piriform fossa this may be due to the oblique this we are this is due to the uh, this is due to the tilt okay you cannot make out properly the left uh, piriform fossa and you can see in this uh, you can make out a node on the left you can you see this node okay very small node there Ah, uh, so this is on the left side, and this is the level, which is the level of the lymph node. This is the level three lymph node because you are seeing at the level of the thyroid cartilage, and the hyoid has gone. Means the below the caudal edge of the hyoid bone. So this is a level three lymph node. Okay, I'm not seeing through the all of the CT cuts. It may not be possible for me, but I will try to explain. So uh, this is a uh, uh, this is the uh, right piriform fossa. Again, you can see the node there. and uh, compared to this always you have to look in the symmetric okay if you are seeing something on one side which is not seen on the other side then you have to think that you are dealing with something pathology so that is how you deal with a uh, head and neck radiology so you can see on left side this is the right paraglottic fat on the left paraglottic fat region can you see a suspicious area there okay which is not present on the right side this is that is suspicious so we do not know whether it is pathological or it is uh, it is not intensely enhancing so you have to you have to look into the other cuts the next cut okay now on this cut it becomes more prominent this cut it becomes more prominent on this cut it becomes little more prominent okay when you see this this is a tumor this is a lesion there so and uh, you have to understand that this is the arachnoid cartilage this is the arachnoid cartilage so and on this side you can make out the paraglottic fat but you cannot make out the paraglottic fat on the left side okay so it means it is obliteration of the left paraglottic fat 
lesion is coming anteriorly to the pre-epiglottic space. This is a, it is coming up to here. And uh, you can see this is at the level of the arachnoid cartilage. The, this is filling the entire left side on the, uh, on the, so at the level of the supraglottis. Okay, so this is the arachnoid cartilage. So the parts of the supraglottis are one, epiglottis. Epiglottis have a free edge, which I have not shown you because it was little on the higher cut. Then you have a, a, a fixed part of the epiglottis. You have the array epiglottic fold, arachnoid. This is the arachnoid cartilage. Then you have the false cord I have shown you, then the ventricle. So these are the parts of the supraglottis. Now, this is at the level of the two occlusal. You are seeing the cricoid cartilage. This is, you, you can slowly start appearing the cricoid cartilage. And this is the level of the cricoarachnoid joint. This is the cricoid cartilage, and this is the arachnoid cartilage. This is called the cricoarachnoid joint. So at this level, you can see the, this is the true occlusal. cord. This is at the level of the true occlusal. cord. And this is the apex of the pyrocon fossa. On the right side, you can make out the apex of the pyrocon fossa. On the left side, you can make out a lesion which is crossing the midline. Actually, it is coming up to here. And it, the anterior commissure is also involved. And the paraglottic fat. And you can see this is the thyroid. This is the thyroid cartilage. This is the arachnoid. And the thyroarachnoid gap is little widened here. This is the widening of the thyroarachnoid gap. And although I never expected this patient to have a fully mobile cord, at least I expected a restriction of the mobility. But the mobility, so initially it started with the T1 disease. But it became a lesion involving the glottis as well as supraglottis. So, and they, it is extension into the pre epiglottic space and paraglottic fat. So, it becomes a T3 disease. And the patient is having a small node. All those by size criteria. Size criteria, when, you, when, when the node is positive, so size criteria by node is positive, when the short axis diameter is more than one centimeter, then it becomes radiologically involved. But in this patient, it is continuous and the, the morphology wise, Although it is a subcentimetric node, we have to consider it as clinically significant. Means we will treat like an involvement. By staging, you can argue that, sir, it is not N1. Okay, I agree that. Whether you treat or not, you will treat it. Okay, fine. Now, this is coming down. So now we are seeing the thyroid cartilage, but you are not seeing any extra laryngeal spread. You are not seeing any extra laryngeal spread, but you are seeing, uh, uh, you are seeing, uh, how do you do Okay. So the, the, in this side, uh, the left side, the pyriform force actually is obliterated. You are not able to make out. Only on the right side, you are able to make out. Then this is the subglottic extension. Uh, so how you will make out a subglottic extension? Usually, you should not see any soft tissue in the cricoid cartilage. So this is a cricoid cartilage. On the left side, you are not seeing any soft tissue. Here, it is suspicious. Can you see? That's an early sign of a subglottic extension. It means you have to think that you are dealing with a tumor, which is extension into supraglottis and also extension. Down. But you cannot, you are not seeing anything beyond the cartilage. So it is, a, a, I cannot make out the inner cortex, but uh, I'm not sure there is no extra laryngeal spread. There is subglottic extension. So it is a T3 disease. Now come to the next, uh, this one. Next, you see, you check. The next, uh, uh, my my lap, I guess, is moving. Again, in those, in this cut, you can see that, so there is a suspicious uh, uh, extension in the subglottis. So this is at the level of the cricoid cartilage. So this is, a, this is a tumor of the left side, filling the entire side on one side, extension to supraglottis, paraglottic fat obliteration, pre-epiglottic space, a sub suspicious subglottic anterior commission involved. Okay, so this is a T3 disease because of two things: one, paraglottic fat obliteration, and also a pre-epiglottic space involved. So, what is a T3 disease? First and foremost thing: one, the size is not included in the staging of a T3 larynx. There are five things which can make a larynx T3. One, semi larynx fix. Two, if a patient is having a post cricoid involvement in there from a supraglottic larynx. Third, paraglottic fat involvement, either from a supraglottic or a glottic. Other is pre epiglottic space from a supraglottic. And fifth one is 
post cricoid involvement from a supraglottic so these are the five criteria to make a laryngeal tumor t okay so all this tumors so in this uh, now we are we, we are compared to this side this is little bulky compared to this side okay this side so there may be and this is so this is suspicious again this is a disease okay now we come to the checklist for a ct scan one the site of the disease the tumor oleum is having prognostic significance cause the bulky tumors the chance of attaining a clinical remission with your chemo radiation may not be less okay then size size can only be size is uh, it not included in the staging pre epiglottic space from a supraglottic tumor tp paraglottic space from a laryngeal tumor is tp post cricoid region t3 disease from a supraglottic tumor extension into other subsites it is t2 transglottic tumor is not t3 it is t2 and their commission involvement will not change the staging of the disease but it is having a clinical importance in early disease in during radiotherapy planning for using you may have to use a bolus you have to use a low energy cartilage because inner cortex is t3 uh, if it is a through one through cartilage t4a Thy thyroid gland involvement t4a and you need to know the superior and inferior extent of the disease prevertebral fascia involvement is uh, is t4b encasement of the carotid artery is t4b any extra laryngeal spread is t4a extra laryngeal spread can be with cartilage destruction or without a cartilage destruction extra laryngeal spread uh, it uh, extra laryngeal spread with a cartilage without a cartilage involvement is mainly due to either due to a thyrohyoid membrane is you know, pierced or through a cricothyroid membrane any lymph nodes it becomes a t3 disease so this patient is having a t3n1 because the pre epiglottic space paraglottic fat involvement and patient is having a lymph node is involved Yes. Um, um, yes. Uh, uh, yes. Um, okay. Then, so it is a T3 disease. Uh, strap muscle involvement, whether it was present in the previous slide. Okay, I will show you that. Okay, I'm not sure because it may be an extra laryngeal. So we are not sure. Okay, we cannot make out because this I need a close discussion with the uh, this one with the uh, with the radiologist. I'm not convinced about this strap muscle involved. Okay. So this is a T3 disease. What other investigations you will do? So it is a T3. Even if the strap muscle is involved, but the cartilage is intact, it is only T4A. But the treatment is again involved. So, uh, what other investigations you have to do? You have to do an X-ray chest. Whether you have to do a PET CT, no, it is not required. Whether you have to do a bone scan, no, it is not required. Then you have to do an ultrasound, no. You have to do a dental evaluation. Okay. So, once you decide a T3 N1, the question is that whether the patient is a candidate for an organ preservation approach or a patient should be considered for a laryngectomy. In, in before 1991, before the publication of the Veteran Affairs Laryngeal Study Group. All these patients were treated with total laryngectomy followed by postoperative failure. Okay, so coming to the uh, other investigations, you have to do a dental evaluation, you have to do an X-ray chest, you have to do baseline investigations for all these patients. Uh, in CT thorax is not required for this patient. PET scan is not required for this patient. Okay, so it's a T3 N1 disease. Okay, by size criteria, it is not uh, a N1 actually. It is a N0. But uh, uh, it is characteristic. We have discussed with the radiologist. It's contagious, so he considers it as lump. So then you have to uh, you have to treat with this patient. So that is the um, so you generally you have to treat with a non-surgical approach. It's a chemo radiation. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, so in such patients, you have to consider a dental profile axis, which includes. Uh, the scaling, and you have to remove the caries. Okay, and you have you will also apply sodium fluoride gel before starting radiotherapy. Now, the how it has evolved. Okay, you may you may be get bored because you have gone through all the articles, the relevant clinical trials. The whole business of organ preservation approach started with 
the VA trial. The VA trial is a landmark trial. It was a phase three trial, which included 332 patients, were randomized, either to do a surgery followed by radiotherapy, or patients received two cycles of induction chemotherapy and VA. Those patients who received induction chemotherapy with cisplatin 5 chlorouracil and after two cycles, they were reassessed for response. And if the patient had a response of 50% or more response, they are offered organ preservation approach. The patients were given radiotherapy after one more cycle of chemotherapy. And the patients who did not receive response to 50% were offered as planned surgery followed by postoperative radiotherapy. The two year results with a median follow up of 33 months, which was published in Veteran Affairs in published in New England Journal of Medicine in 1991, showed that the two year laryngeal preservation rate was around, uh, around uh, 64%. And sorry, two years laryngeal preservation of 68%. And two year survival of the two arms, surgery followed by radiotherapy or induction chemo followed by reassessment was 60 the conclusion is that those patients who received induction chemotherapy, and if there is a response, you can consider organ preservation in two-thirds of the patients without compromising disease peak survival or organ survival. So that was the conclusion of the veteran of this lab study. Then the pitfalls was they included a T4 patient. T3 and T4 patients were also included in the trial. And there was a third cycle of chemotherapy. We do not know what is the rationale of giving that before starting radio. Because assessment and decision regarding treatment was taken after two cycles. And so everyone started understanding that there is a role for induction chemotherapy. And if you give induction chemotherapy, and the patients can be considered for organ preservation. Then after that, the people have moved the people, uh, okay, how do you, uh, if considering NACT strider, how soon you, okay, that's a very good question. Okay, any patient who is receiving induction chemotherapy, I will come to that. Okay, I will just uh, say the evolution of treatment, then I will take the question. Okay, uh, so uh, after the induction chemotherapy, then people have started thinking of, why don't you consider uh, a radical chemo, concurrent chemo, because Based on the McKenzie meta-analysis published in Lancet in 2000, which have shown that the concurrent chemo radiation is having a five-year survival benefit of 8%, and induction chemotherapy was not showing any benefit. So why don't you consider an induction, sorry, concurrent? Then there was an attempt by the RTOG, that is called the RTOG 9111 clinical trial. This was a three-arm phase three randomized trial, comparing three non-surgical approaches in stage three and stage four patients who are cartilage intact. And the cartilage destruction patients, T4 patients with cartilage destruction were not included like VA trial. And this is a 3M trial. And 3M trial, it, uh, it, one arm was concurrent chemo radiation. Second arm was the, uh, the, uh, the induction chemo followed by reassessment. That was the uh, experimental arm of the VA trial, became the control arm in the RTOG 9111. The third arm was radio, radiotherapy alone. And there are two, three, two publications and three updates for the RTOG 911. Initially, the data was published in November in 2003 in New England Journal of Medicine, and it showed, and it showed, uh, in uh, it showed that the patients who received uh, concurrent chemo radiation had a better local control and laryngeal preservation when it was data was published. The three-year follow was checked, and the Laryngeal preservation was 88% in patients who received concurrent chemo radiation. It was 75% in patients who received induction followed by radiotherapy. And it was 70% in patients who received radiotherapy. And it was similar for local regional control. And the overall survival data was not mature at that time. And the data was updated in ASCO annual meeting in 2016. And it showed a five-year laryngeal preservation in patients who received concurrent chemo radiation was 84%. And it was superior to patients who received induction chemo followed by radiation or radiation. And there was no difference in survival between the two arms. The data was updated and published in JCVO in March 2013 with a median follow-up of three months. It showed 
there is no difference between survival between the three arms. That was one. Number two, there is no difference in distant metastasis between concurrent chemo radiation or patients with a CD induction followed by immunotherapy or radiotherapy. And the laryngeal preservation was, 10-year laryngeal preservation was 81.7 percent in patients who received concurrent chemo radiation. And it was superior to induction chemo followed by radiotherapy or radiotherapy. There was no difference in laryngeal preservation or local regional, local regional control in patients who received between induction chemo followed by radiotherapy or radiotherapy. And the overall survival were similar in both arms. So then the people have started accepting the concurrent chemo radiation became the standard after the publication in came in New England Journal of Medicine in 2003. And the Europeans believed that there is a role for induction chemo. And the, the people thought that, okay, why don't you consider a TPF as three drug compared to two drug? There was a trial called the GORTAC 2001, 2001 clinical trial. You maybe get bored with all this data, but you have to remember these are all landmark trials. Got a 2001 clinical trial. This is a phase three randomized trial comparing two induction chemotherapy regimes. The patients received, the patients with laryngeal and hypopharyngeal tumors were included in the trial. So in patients who have, in patients who have uh, in the RTOG9111 and MEA trial, they included only patients with laryngeal tumors. Whereas in GOTAC 2001 clinical trial, include larynx and hypopharyngeal tumors. They are randomized to two arm, two comparing two induction chemotherapy. One is three cycles. One arm received three cycles of PF, other arm received three cycles of PF. There's 110 patients in each arm. In the data, it is randomized to receive. And after three cycles, patients who received at least 50% regression are offered chemo radiation. There is no response. They're offered surgery for the radiation. The data was initially published in Journal of National Cancer Institute in 2009 and showed that laryngeal preservation and laryngeal dysfunction free survival was better in patients who received TPF compared to PF. There's no difference in survival, which or overall survival, disease free survival, or local regional control in patients who received TPF compared to PF. Data was again updated in the same journal, Journal of National Cancer Institute in 2015, with a median follow-up of 100 months, 105 months. Similar, similar uh, pattern of results. And it showed that laryngeal preservation was better in three drugs versus two drugs. So in, there was one way by showing that the, in Europeans, three drug is superior to two drug in terms of laryngeal preservation. And in Americans showed that concurrent is superior to induction followed by radio therapy. So how to proceed further? There is an attempt from the GOTAC group. There's an ongoing clinical trial called the sort out clinical trial. There's a two-arm clinical trial. The first arm is you give concurrent chemo radiation plus or minus salvage laryngectomy. Second arm is you consider three cycles of PPF. And those patients who achieve 50% regression are offered radiotherapy. And patients who do not receive 50% regression are concerned for surgery followed by post operative radiotherapy. This is an ongoing clinical trial. So this is the evidence for giving the chemo radiation so far. There are two, uh, there are two, uh, there are one clinical trial with the, there was a phase two trial uh, from the University of Michigan showing one cycle of PF, Susan Arba clinical trial. That's a phase two trial, which included around 70 patients. And how many cycles of, uh, here the madam has asked, uh, a induction chemotherapy strider alone, how many, how so, soon you will anticipate response. Okay, in such situations, you cannot say that the, there is no fixed number of cycles of induction. The main, you, we believe that chemo radiation, concurrent chemo radiation is the standard treatment. We are giving induction chemotherapy because to facilitate chemo radiation. Otherwise, if you start concurrent chemo radiation, if there is an airway compromise, this will lead on to strider. Patient may have to undergo tracheostomy while on radiotherapy. So you do not want to, you do not, do not want to have that. That's why you are starting induction chemo. In such situations, you have to reassess the patient after each cycle of induction. There is no, uh, there is no, there is no data to assess such situation. But practically speaking, you have to reassess the patient. If there is no uh, airway compromise after one cycle of chemotherapy, when the patient comes for the second cycle, then you can plan, you can continue with chemo radiation. That is because this was not planned for induction chemotherapy because we are believing that chemo radiation concurrently is the best 
concurrent has to be given, but this was given only to uh, only because the patient had an airway compromise. Okay, uh, then the uh, I will discuss the tracheostomy part later because there are special situations that I will come to that. Okay, now coming to the treatment of this particular patient. So after the yeah, before chemo radiation, you have to have a proper discussion with the family. Okay, why we need to have the concurrent chemo radiation is not a full lunch. It's associated with a lot of modeling. It is associated with a lot of modeling. So you have to understand that this is with it comes with a five stand. So, it's, so we have to we have to understand that we have to be ready to fight for the family. Okay, so there should be a proper counseling. Okay. There's a proper counseling. There is acute and late toxicity, late death, toxic death can occur due to a chemo radiation program. Selection is very important. Never consider a chemo radiation for 70 year old man, above 70 year old man, because the mechanism meta analysis have shown that if you give chemotherapy after 70 years, there can be a detrimental effect. So yeah, that chemo may not work for that patient. Performance status too. We do not have any clear evidence to give chemo radiation for these patients. So all the data is for patients less than 70 years and patients with good performance status. Good family support is very important. Proper nutrition and the family should be ready to uh, adhere to the instructions by the treating physician. That is very important for a successful chemo radiation program. So you have to monitor the patient properly. You have to, you should have ensure proper nutrition, hydration, and a proper, uh, proper nutrition, hydration, then the adequate analgesics, these are all important for having a good success of a chemo radiation program. And also, the most important thing, there's a, the head and neck surgery, and the role is still there. They are the people who do a proper staging. They are the people who take biopsy for you. And other is, if you fail, and uh, they are the people who are going to do salvage therapy. And uh, the laryngeal, the, there is uh, the concurrent chemo radiation, plus bar minus salvage laryngectomy is equal to total laryngectomy followed by post operation. Concurrent chemo radiation alone may not be equivalent to total laryngectomy followed by post operation. If you give the, the RTOG 9111 has shown that the five-year laryngectomy preservation rate is 84 percent If you treat 100 patients with chemo radiation program, the 80 patients, the eight patients, 10, if you treat 10, eight patients may not have any issues. Eight, uh, eight patients may not have an issue. Okay, they may achieve complete condition. One patient will have a residual edema, and one patient will have a laryngeal edema. That is going to uh, have maybe a problem for the for the physician as well as for the surgeon. Okay, then uh, okay. Okay, Strider being an emergency situation as it is advisable to go for induction chemotherapy, keeping tracheostomy as second option. Okay, if there is an air, I didn't mention that if a patient is in severe Strider, never, I never said that admit the patient and consider induction chemotherapy. Okay, if the patient is having, there is a compromise in airway, there is a threat to his life, definitely tracheostomy should be done. Okay, I'm saying about a situation where the patient is having a mild Strider. Okay, in such situations, you consider that patient for induction chemotherapy to avoid a tracheostomy because the quality of life will come down. And treating a patient with a tracheostomy, that I will come to that later. Okay, now coming to the next, uh, okay, there is some, okay. Now coming to the chemo radiation. Uh, so this patient can be treated either by a, an IMRT or can be treated by a two-dimensional epilepsy. I'm not sure whether many, any institutions are treating these patients with IMRT. Okay, there are at least many institutions where a few institutions they are treated with two dimensional therapy. When you plan a two dimensional therapy before discussing the IMRT part, you have to understand certain things. One, the treatment of any T3 larynx, either supraglottic or glottic, the whole neck treatment is required. Okay, then you have to look proper clinical examination. That's where is the superior extent, whether extension of the valvula, base of tongue is free, superiorly whether lesion is having any subglottic extension is present any anti-recommission involvement is there, whether the patient is having any tracheostomy, whether the patient is having a level three or level four more, whether you will be able to split at the level of the C6 vertebra, that is the cricoid region. These are all very important. Okay, so I will give you a few clinical scenarios. T3 larynx is a heterogeneous disease. Patient may have, a, this patient is having anti-recommission involvement. And in that situation, if we are using a two-dimensional therapy, always you have to use a low energy 
you have to use either a forum photo or you have to consider a hypothesis. If you have a patient is having a subglottic extension, you may not be able to split in a lower extent. You have to do a treat with a lateral parallel pair with a couch patient. The patient is having a tracheostomy. The patient is having lower cervical nerves. You may be you may not be able to split. If you, you may have to increase the superior extent if a patient is having extension to base of or extensive level to the upper. Okay, these are the important things you have to consider when you plan to understand. When you consider IMRT, in this patients, you have to understand that how to contour the patient. So you all know that uh, this you have the, uh, the treatment. Uh, it includes the concurrent chemo radiation and uh, the, the, uh, the GTV is the, the clinical target volume, sorry, the gross, gross tumor volume. So that is seen by the clinical examination and imaging. So this we have seen, there was something there. So this was the GTV. And the CTV is you give 5 MMR. So that is, I will say CTV 66, CTV 60, and CTV 64. Because CTV 66, CTV 66 gray in 30 fractions. So that is the high risk volume. 60 gray in 30 is the intermediate risk volume. And the 54 in gray is the low risk volume or a prophylactic. So a patient is having this use your GTV. Then you give a 5 MMR. Yeah? So that will be your GTV. In, there is another CTV60, which should include the pre-epic lobby space. And that I will discuss later. So this is the, you give 5 MMR margin, and this, whether you can you extract from the, whether you can reduce from the, uh, this is one, uh, whether you can reduce from the uh, air, and also whether you can reduce from the cartilage, that's a matter of discussion. Then, okay. Uh, Okay, just remind me that I will discuss in T4 whether organ preservation and larynx. Let me finish this uh, uh, discussion. Okay, then I will take up the questions. Don't worry, I will leave only after taking up all your questions. Okay, uh, next is, uh, 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 okay. there is some problem, my mouse is not working. Okay, fine. Okay, this is at the lower part. So you have the GTV, this is your CTV 66. Okay, again, this is your GTV. You give 5 mm margin, that will be your GTV. You're coming down, this is again GTV, CTV. Okay, this is your GTV. And this is a, this is area you asked whether a strap muscle involvement is not there. So actually, I have a little included that also. But six, CTV 60 will include that. Okay, so this is CTV 60. Now coming to the, so it's, uh, sorry, CTV 66. Now coming to the CTV 60. The CTV, if you, there is a guideline which came in 2018. Uh, okay, I will discuss that also. So this is uh, the GTV. Uh, this is the CTV 66 and you have a CTV 60. You only have five on the In the new guideline, it says that you can reduce from the higher cartilage. Okay, you can also edit the airway, uh, air, and also you need not go to the posterior. There are the three things for a increase of the Okay, so there is CTV 60. Again, this is your GTV, the CTV 66, CTV 60. Coming down, down, down. Okay, this is your CTV 60. So then uh, you have, I have included this posterior thermal wall little down there. Okay, so this is the area where, so this guideline says, okay, so this suppose if this is the tumor, this is the supraglottic larynx because this has a level of the arachnoid cartilage, this is thyroid cartilage. You are seeing a tumor there, this is the red one, that is the GTV. Then you have, the, this is the yellow one, that is the CTV 60, it's 66, that's the high risk volume. And you can edit that to the airway, okay? You need not include the airway. Then you have the another fiber, this is the blue one, okay? Then you can edit from the cartilage, okay? This is, you can edit from the cartilage. Also, you, you need not go to the posterior thermal wall. So you can edit. Okay, so this will be the green one, will be your CTV 60. And there are whether what dose to be given to that CTV P2, that is called the CTV P2. CTV P1 will be the higher score. CTV P2 should be the intermediate score. How, how, how much should be the radiation dose to be given, whether it is 60 or 54? Okay, I'm not confident to give 54 to that. Area, to be very honest with you. Okay, I will give 60. So this, if you have a tumor like this, this is the paraglottic fat obliteration. This is on the left side, right paraglottic fat is obliterated. This is a tumor there. 
this is the green one sorry the red one is the gtv you have the green one that you have a green one taking the cartilage also editing from the posterior femoral wall editing from the air so this will be so this green one will be your high risk ct that is called the ctvp1 then you give 5 mm margin this will be ctvp2 but you can edit from that you can edit from the a, a, a the extra laryngeal part so this is ctvp2 and you can also edit from the posterior femoral wall and you can also edit from the air so this will be your so it is better to include the the this lesion is crossing little so it may be better to include the, the opposite paraglottic part also so this will be your now uh, so this uh, this uh, this is what we have done so this is the same tumor if you give 5 mm margin so 5 5 that's 1 cm so we can edit from their cartilage and you can also edit from posterior you can edit from posterior femoral wall and we have not edited from the air so this is uh, for that patient now coming to the nodes small nodes are there so this small single node so this is your ttv node then you give 5 mm margin so this node is at the level of the level 2 because the hyoid bone is there. So this is a superior cut, this is the inferior cut, this is the uh, four length of the hyoid bone. So this is at the level of the level two or the superior length of the level three. This is at the level of the level three because this is, uh, you can see the five mm margin. This is a, see, the GTV node. Then you give five mm margin, that will be your CTV node, that is CTV 66. Then the concern is that the how should use the level two on what dose to be given to the ipsilateral level 2, ipsilateral level 3, the contralateral level 2, contralateral level 3. So since the patient is having level 2 node is present and 3 node is present, then the node is at the junction. So generally you agree that level 2 and level 3 should be 60 days. Okay, there are people who say that 54 is also enough for that group of patients. But I'm not confident, to be very honest with you, I always will give 60 days to the ipsilateral level 2 and level because that's a no response. Ipsilateral level four, I will treat with a 54 prophylactic dose. I will not treat level five because, because it's a small node, I will not treat level five. On the contralateral node, you can either argue that the level two and level three need to be treated only with 54. I'm also, I agree with you. But for this patient, the lesion was crossing to the opposite side. So I decided to treat level two and level three to 60. And level five, no. Level four, so this is the dose, and the patient, uh, the prophylactic dose was so level two and level three was given sixty gray, and the level four was given a fifty four. So when when it is both together, so this is your the final volume. This is your CTV, uh, this is your higher CTV that is called CTV one or sixty six gray volume, and this is your sixty gray volume. Okay, this is your CTV you know, this is your Okay, and this is your, this this is actually, uh, this is the 66. Okay, this is 66. You give a margin for your CTV. So that will be your CTV. Now, you the distribution. This is 66 gray with the CTV. So this is the, your CTV. This is CTV. I've not put this. This is the CTV. So this is a, this is a 646. That's the 90 plus 90. Uh, 66. Okay, so coming to that. Now, for, yes, now I will take up the questions. Regarding the uh, tracheostomy patients, tracheostomy per se, we cannot say that this patient is a contraindication. There was a consensus guidelines which was given, which came in a journal in 2009 by KNI, shows that in those patients who have tracheostomy should not be considered for future organ preservation clinical trials. But they didn't mention that this can be treated outside of clinical trial. Okay, then, okay, so that is uh, one important thing. Uh, the second thing is, uh, okay, well, they, regarding the absolute contraindication for laryngeal preservation in T4. If a patient is having the larynx T4 disease can be either due to a cartilage destruction. Okay, either due to a cartilage destruction. Okay, uh, I will show you clinical scenarios. Okay, uh, I, have, I have to stop sharing, then I have to take another PPT. Okay or I will send you by email uh, to Dr. Divya. Okay, that uh, if a patient is having a cartilage destruction is present through and through cartilage, then that patient is not a candidate for an organ preservation. That patient should undergo a total laryngeal. 
But if a patient is having a cartilage impact and patient is having extra lumbar spine due to a thyroid membrane, it's extending into strap muscle. That patient should be offered a chemo radiation, provided that patient is not a candidate for. Uh, that patient is not having aspiration. Do you need a one centimeter node requires 70 or that is uh, uh, 70? Or do you feel one centimeter node requires 70 or that overkill 60% should be enough? Okay, I'll, uh, around tracheostomy, around tracheostomy. Okay. Uh, do you feel one centimeter? Okay, do you feel one centimeter node? Okay, if you, if you feel that this is a involved node, then you have to do, do you give the high dose. Okay, but if you say that it is not involved, okay, that's fine. Then you give intermediate dose, that's fine. But that once you decide for it is involved, okay, and you upstate as N1, then you have to give a high dose to that. Node plus 5M. That should be the intermediate dose. Okay. Now, if, uh, dose through enough dose concern around tracheostomy. Okay, that's a real concern. Uh, I Because a patient who have their severe reactions may be there. But if the tumor is higher up, and it is that area is not having involvement of the tumor. And if you are using an IMRT, you can use a propylene dose to that area. But if you are using two-dimensional radiotherapy, you may not be able to split that area. And the patient may require a high dose to that. Now, if the patients, how you monitor the patient during treatment, that is very important. And chemoradiation in head and neck is a, it's a lethal thing. Because the patient can die due to your treatment. If you give radiation for breast cancer, if you give a chemo radiation for a preoperative chemo radiation for a or a carcinoma cell, patient may not die due to your treatment. But in a head and neck, if you give concurrent chemo radiation to a wrong patient, or if you are not properly monitoring the patient, then you may the patient may not come back to for the follow-up. They, you have to consider proper nutrition, electrolytes analysis its proper uh, uh, care of the oral cavity that may not be very relevant in laryngeal tumors but in general i'm saying then the, a proper uh, meticulous evaluation during weekly evaluation is required and meticulous in the, in the proper insertion of the right stool or you start from a peg from the beginning or you start the patient with proper analysis it's uh, so then you have to do a culture and sensitivity. If you have to do a, a weekly weight measurement, you have to consider electrolytes correction. These are all very important during the treatment. Otherwise, we may not we may burn our fingers. Okay. So then, uh, how will you monitor the treatment? Okay. What happened to my slides? It's not moving. Okay. Yes. The uh, special clinical situations, one we have discussed, that's tracheostomy. Second is a patient who is having elderly patients. That also I have mentioned. Suppose if you're having a 77-year-old gentleman, it's the same patient, E3 and 1, and patient is having a performance status 2. And uh, I do not know how to treat the patient, to be very honest with you, because there is no impact. Okay, but this patient should not be concerned for a chemo radiation. That, that is very short. Second is, can you give consider radical radiotherapy? That also needs a lot of discussion. Okay, if it is less than 75 years, yes, do I will consider radical. Above, if it is above 75 years and if a patient is having a performed service too, they have to corner, they have to they have really corner me to consider radical. Otherwise, uh, I will, I'm not keen. Okay, so between my, my thumb rule is very simple. If it is less than 70 years and performed service one, you are the dictator. Between 70 and 75, or PS2, it needs a lot of discussion. Above 75 years, or performed sentence two, generally palliation. But in very highly selective patients, you have to take the patient. If a patient was ex military, excellent performance at 77, I may consider radical therapy. In general, I'm considering this patient. And patients who have a renal impact, and either you can consider that patient for a uh, radical radiotherapy alone, or you can consider monoclonal antibody plus radio. Now, uh, so you have to understand, yes, a few questions. Okay, we will take up that. And, okay, uh, yes, that's a very good question. Altered traction radiotherapy is a very good option that patients would have who are not candidates for chemo radiation. But in larynx alone, there, there is no data is not uh, uh, 
that concrete to say that, okay, uh, definitely in all hedonic situations, that's an option. And larynx and hyperpharynx, they are very adjacent structures, but they differ in many ways. Hyperpharynx, it is staged T3 and T4, they are staged by size criteria. And whereas in larynx, it is based, okay, when to stop radiotherapy, that I will discuss later. Okay, in I, let me finish uh, the pyriform sinus. Okay, in pyriform sinus and supraglottic larynx, very adjacent structures. If a patient is having primary in the pyriform sinus, most of them present with an advanced pain. They will have a nutritional compromise. A high chance for a nodal involvement. They have a more nodal involvement compared to larynx. Organ preservation rates are poor. Salvage rates are poor. High chance for systemic relapse and high chance for And the most important concern is that these patients may not become a candidate for a plant treatment. That is a real concern for a pyriform sinus. What is T3 pyriform sinus? Three things. One, tumor size more than four centimeters. Second, patient who have a lesion extending in the cervical lesion. Third is hemilarynx. So this on right side, pyriform process is fine. Left side, it is obligatory. Extending into right paraglottic tract. Okay, and the prevertebral phase is intact. So it is a T3 disease. And this was T3 because the hemilarynx was mixed. And in such patients, whether the concurrent chemo radiation may be the right approach, okay, we have to sell it because post cricoid positive pharyngeal wall is different. If it is pyriform fossa, T3 disease, this is an area where there is a role for induction. Okay, this is based on EOTC trial, and you can also go to NCC trial. The category one recommendation is to consider induction. And this is what we follow at our RCC trial. So you consider. And this may be the, apart from nasopharyngeal carcinoma, this may be the only situation where there is a definite role for induction chemotherapy in pyriform sinus, T3 pyriform sinus. This is based on the EORTC trial. Okay, this was again a, a randomized trial comparing surgery followed by radiotherapy or two cycles of induction chemotherapy. How it is different from the VA trial was that in the EORTC trial, the patients should achieve complete clinical remission, at least with three cycles. Okay, this is what we follow at our institution also. You give two cycles of chemotherapy. If the patients who achieve complete partial remission, you give one more cycle of chemotherapy. Those patients who achieve complete remission, consider radiotherapy. If no complete remission, after three cycles of chemotherapy, patients should undergo surgery followed by radiotherapy. The real concern is that the patient should be willing to undergo surgery if the patient is not attaining complete clinical remission with three cycles of chemotherapy. And if you feel that this patient will not become a willing for a total laryngectomy plus partial pharyngectomy plus a bilateral elective neck dissection or neck dissection followed by a reconstruction post op radiation. There is no point in taking the patient for an induction program to take the patient for chemo radiation. But in, in, even in the URTC, when they followed up this stringent criteria, when they published the results initially in 1997, it has shown that. The three year laryngeal preservation rate was 42%. I told you earlier that in patients who have laryngeal tumors, the five year laryngeal preservation rate was 80%. Three year laryngeal preservation rate patients for patients who achieved complete clinical remission with three cycles of induction chemotherapy, the three year laryngeal preservation rate was only 42%, even attaining complete clinical remission. And there was no difference between survival and between the two arms. The data was updated in Annals of Oncology with 10 year follow up in 2012, which have shown that if those patients who received induction chemo followed by radiotherapy and that achieved complete clinical remission, the 10 year survival was 13. And patients who underwent surgery followed by post op radiation, 10 year survival was 20. It means it's a bad disease. A T3 pyrophone person, this is a bad disease. Whereas if you look into the RTUG 9111, the 10 year follow, 10 year follow have shown that the 10 year survival is around the patients who receive the non surgical approach. Okay, then, so this is a hyperpharynx. Yes. When we will stop radiation, at what level of toxicity? Okay. So, in general, if a patient is having a grade 3 toxicity, it is not an indication for stopping radiation. Okay. You take a, if it is an involving oral cavity, you take a swab, you can do a culture and sensitivity. You put a RILES tube, if not, then you give proper analgesics like liquid morphine, 
prophylactic antibiotics, you need TC permits, no alkylate imbalance, you continue. I'm sorry, continue reading. But if the patients have grade four, then you have to stop. Yes, uh, the prognosis of transglottic involvement is poor compared to pure glottic involvement. Yes, if a patient is having subglottic extension or patient is having supraglottic extension, then the patient have a chance, high chance for nodal involvement. Even if you look into the pure glottic tumor, subglottic extension is considered as a prognostic factor. And that's, that patient will not do a better. And minimal involvement of the cartilage, uh, contraindication for laryngeal Okay, uh, Divya is uh, concerned about that. This is her second question. So in patients who have uh, inner cortex involvement, that is only T3, okay. Then in such patients, uh, uh, in such patients, uh, there is no need to do a laryngectomy. You can consider a hemorrhagation. But if a patient is having through one through cartilage, cartilage destroyed and extra laryngeal spread, then that patient is not a candidate for a hemorrhagation. Why? Just based on a subset analysis from the VF trial. When they analyzed, when they did the subset analysis between T3 and T4 patients, in patients who received induction chemo, reassessment, and radiotherapy, in patients who received induction chemotherapy, then you can see that the salvage rates were doubled compared to T3 and T4. It was 56% in patients who are T4, and it was 28% in patients who are T4. That is one of the reasons why in the, in the RTUG91, double one, T4 patients were not taken into the organ patient approach. Okay, so then, uh, uh, okay, then, uh, then, so if you are interested, you can read my review article, which was published two years back in 2018, the current status of organ preservation, past on the You just Google or you search in the PubMed, this will be the first article, the current status of organ preservation, past on the Then, uh, okay, then anything. Okay, how will you evaluate the patient after radiotherapy or chemo radiation? Okay. Uh, in patients who have, how to evaluate patient if the post patients who have already undergone chemo radiation or uh, uh, radiotherapy. So this is uh, uh, again, uh, this is ICMR guidelines by God's grace. I'm also part of the formulation of this national guideline. Uh, so uh, I took hours to uh, draw this chart. To be very honest with you, it took around ten hours for me to uh, draw this chart and to get a consensus from the oral panel members. Yes, then, so after evaluation, after treatment, so you will never evaluate a patient, larynx or hypopharynx, before AT. Okay, you first do an endoscopy at AT, clinical and endoscopy examination at eight weeks. Okay, at eight weeks, if the primary is in remission and neck also, the neck is in complete response and primary is also in complete response, he keeps the patient on the Okay, and if the patient, is having partial response or a residual disease at eight weeks. Then you wait for another four more weeks. That is the evaluation is done at 12 weeks. At, at that situation, three things can happen. One, CR. If neck is in remission, four of them. The patient is at 12 weeks if the patient is having residual disease. So this is the situation and time you consider that patient for considering a salvage laryngeal. Before 12 weeks, you will never take a decision for a salvage laryngeal. At 12 weeks, you take a call for salvage laryngeal. At 12 weeks, if a patient is having residual disease, generally, if you have a buccal mucosa disease, after radiotherapy, if there is a residual disease, generally, you do not take a biopsy. Organ oropharynx, you do not take a biopsy. But in, in larynx, you take a biopsy because after laryngectomy, if the HPR comes as necrosis only, then the people will blame the surgeon. You do a biopsy. If it is positive, you take a CT scan, especially neck and thorax, because you rule out any function, function any other thing. Then if it is operable, then you do a salvage surgery. If the <coughs> neck, then you follow up. If a patient is a biopsy, yes. If a biopsy is negative and the patient is having a residual disease, the patient is having a bra. Can you a bra? Yes. Thank you. Uh, so if a patient is a biopsy is negative, but the patient is having a residual disease in the endoscopy, you do not know, actually, because you are seeing a residual disease. 
but the biopsy is negative. In such situations, you have to discuss with the patient regarding pros and cons. Because what is the advantage if you do surgery? You may lose the window because you may not you may not lose the window because the patient sometimes the patient may deteriorate general condition or the lesion may progress in that situation you may not be able to do salvage therapy. But what is the disadvantage? If you do an H, then they, they you do a laryngectomy, then the final HPR may be negative. So you have discussed the pros and cons. The patient decide for surgery, then you take a CT scan or probably do salvage. If the patient decides for observation, then you do a serial endoscopy. If you are seeing a laryngeal edema, no fan disease, the rule number one, never take a biopsy. This can aggravate the edema and it can lead on to chondronectosis, and so many other things. Okay, never talk. Okay, you take a CT scan, rule out a submucosal disease. If there is a submucosal disease, again you discuss with the patient. If no disease, you do a serial endoscopy. Whether PET will help, I do not know. If you discuss three experts, three will say three different. Okay, I do not know. Because there will be inflammation beyond which SUV in this disease, I don't know. Regarding the neck, at 12 weeks, if there is in remission, you follow, provided the primary is in remission. If partial response at 12 weeks, okay, then there's no need to do an FNA. Negative FNA does not mean anything. If it is positive, that's fine. You take a CT scan. No, it is not adherent to the skin. Artery is free, carotid artery is free, or problem. Salvage neck disease, provided primary is in If primary is not in remission, then you do a salvage laryngectomy plus a neck disease. CT neck, in all problems, that's the patient is evaluated. Okay, so this is a, how you evaluate after, and this is available in the web, ICMR, right? Okay, so this is regarding the um, next, so I will take the questions. I have put a very controversial thing, okay, there, you can see. Okay, are you interested how to generate wealth for long term? This is also one area area of my passion. Okay, if you are interested, we can discuss about stock market. Uh, okay, later, not now. Can you please uh, shortly elaborate on toxicant should be uh, added in this part? Yes, sure. But then, missing any other I think uh, I have answered almost every question. Okay, yeah, uh, DAS is a real, uh, is going to be a future. Yes, potential future for all for DOS if there is any laryngeal preservation. Of course, this is very important because uh, that is one of the areas where the new guidelines is that positive pharyngeal wall should be uh, uh, preserved as far as possible to preserve the this one uh, indication for a different indication. Okay. contraindications for biopsy okay so uh, again there was a discussion in the uh, icmr panel whether to consider all patients for biopsy if possible and it is not going to uh, this uh, it produce a tracheostomy then you try to do a biopsy because biopsy is desirable but as far as possible you try to do a biopsy okay only situation where there is an airway compromise but there is no severe stride but do you feel that you have to take a consent for a tracheostomy if you do a flexible endoscopy and biopsy. In such situations, you have to consider for an FNA. You have to, you have to uh, negotiate for an FNA rather than considering a biopsy. But in pure glottic tumors, you may have to take a consent for a tracheostomy and do a biopsy because the nodes will not be seen. In T3, uh, T3 larynx, the chance of having a lymph node involvement is only 10 to 15 percent in a pure glottic. Even if it is T4, if it's a pure glottic tumor, chance of lymph node involvement is only 15 to 20 percent. Yes, uh, your management protocol for late laryngeal edema. Okay, uh, that's a very good question. As long as it is not making any problems, you master Linux. If it is producing laryngeal dysfunction, it leads to deterioration of pulmonary function, uh, or if you have a, a, you need a patient is having laryngeal dysfunction, then you have to intervene. Otherwise, that's fine. So you do a master lena. Or when should be in a larynx in case of malignancy? It is, if there is an airway compromise, you have to do a tracheostomy. Otherwise, there is no need for a tracheostomy. Then 
where another question is that when you do a decannulation after macrostomy and patient undergoes a chemo radiation, you would wait for six months and uh, you wait for a six months and uh, then after that you reassess the airway, no disease, no edema, then you do a decannulation. Uh, prophylactic tracheostomy. I'm not a fan of doing a prophylactic tracheostomy. Uh, because as far as possible, prophylactic tracheostomy. Okay, okay, you can, you have both ways of doing that. But if you had to do a biopsy and you need a tracheostomy, then you do a tracheostomy. And do a Otherwise, uh, you can consider induction chemo program. So I'm not a fan of doing that. Okay, that's again a topic, controversial topic, whether a tracheostomy site should be included in the RT portal always. Suppose if you have a supraglottic tumor, overhanging tumor, and you do a tracheostomy, and uh, uh, then whether that should be included in the RT portal. At least you have to do a prophylactic dose to that. That's my personal opinion. Uh, it's almost um, 9, 9, 15, almost one hour, 15 minutes. Thank you for bearing with me. Okay, uh, if you have any questions, uh, if no questions, shall we wind up? Thank you so much for uh, joining uh, this evening with me for this discussion. Uh, uh, because I, I felt that I should not, I was initially not planning to do any PPT, rather I was planning to discuss the case alone, but uh, I just put few slides. It was uh, really wonderful, sir. <clears throat> and, uh... We all are thankful to you that you have spent your precious time and educated us all. And uh, we look forward to more classes from you. And we can certainly look forward to this topic, uh, which is displayed on the slide. <laughs> this, is, so, uh, this is mainly meant for the juniors, of course. Okay, so uh, why I'm saying, because uh, uh, you are all getting a stipend. So if you, have, if you can spare, say, 2,000 rupees, uh, so I just want to give you an introduction because if you can spend 2,000 rupees, save 2,000 rupees, and if you invest in a mutual fund, which gives you 15% returns, at the end of 30 years, it will be 1.41 crores. This is called the power of compound. So the most important thing is that you have to start investing at the, at, in early years of your career. And you are all doing your residence. So you're all young. Okay, I learned this when I was 35. Okay, so I'm, now I'm 45. Okay, so if you can learn these things much early, then definitely you can make a lot of money. Okay, thank you very much for your patience. Thank you. Right. Patience. Thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Arun, and thank you, thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Yeah.